Uh, welcome to the My Community Manager Hangout. Um, we're talking about visual thinkers today. And I've got John Bell from Ogilvy, as well as some other interesting people to take part in the discussion. Um, if I ask everyone to introduce themselves, starting with Barry, that would be a great start. I think I think Barry's Google Plus is frozen. Hassan, can I ask you to introduce yourself? Hey guys, um, I'm social director. I'm Hassan, a social director at Digital Banks. Um, we are a social and digital agency. We work with lifestyle, culture, um, hospitality brands, and we're based in London. So yeah, that's me. Hi. Did you all hear that? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm Mark. Okay, uh, I'm Mark Bang. Uh, I provide social media uh, consulting services and training, uh, and I work out of Virginia in the United States here, but uh, very interested in uh, uh, learning today from these folks. So uh, that's it. Thank you for inviting me, uh, Ben. Um, and uh, I'm Matt Baker, who we know uh, sort of professionally. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, uh, I'm Matt Baker. Um, I help run BAM London. We're a um, research agency that um, specialises in what we call visual thinking, which is using uh, primarily photography and video to help um, sort of capture behaviour and analyse it and share it and uh, help engage clients with our debriefs. And lastly, uh, John, thanks very much for coming on to the Hangout with us. Um, would you like to give an introduction to who you are and what you do? Sure. So I'm uh, John Bell. I run uh, Social at Ogilvy, which is Ogilvy's uh, global social media solutions team. So we're about um, oh, 600 folks strong across 35 markets applying social-based uh, solutions to clients like Nestle, Ford, American Express, IBM, and others. So I'm uh, thrilled to be here to be talking about... Um, Kind of visual imagery and how it's uh, actually a big part of what we're doing with a lot of our clients. But happy to be here. Brilliant. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm also really interested to talk about. So I had some questions I wanted to ask um, John and everyone else. Would it be possible to sort of start off um, just with a brief um, sort of what what you're doing um, visually and, and in what spaces, John? Uh, sure. So, I mean, I think for us, um, a lot of the focus on um, using visual imagery, which includes still images, photographs, infographics, um, videos of a variety of types from short, you know, Vine and Instagram style videos all the way through the hi-fi videos that we've been known for for years, are really um, kind of coming to bear against how we post on Facebook. Um, how we use obviously Pinterest, the tumblers that we are creating for a variety of clients, um, IBM Blur, one of the tumblers that we've created for IBM uh, all around the kind of patent and inventions mm -hmm. history of that particular brand. Through Instagram of course, um, uh, Twitter and Vine and corollary back to Instagram video of course and also interestingly enough just starting now on a few projects um, uh, for Google Glass, and the reason I bring up Google Glass is because I think in addition to GoPro, um, the kind of short POV uh, video um, production that is kind of uh, native to that particular uh, device is, is starting to capture the attention of a lot of the brands that we're working with as well. So that gives you a spectrum of the platforms that we're working on. Mm -hmm. On that front, John, I, um, we're recently very excited about the new autographer device <laughs> that allows sort of people to sort of you know capture sort of real time behavior that might enable us to do sort of more longitudinal studies of how people behave um, it's quite expensive at the moment uh, 400 quid but um, is that something that you see as as sort of being fundamentally sort of part of the way in which people record what they're doing and sharing it i don't know i'd love to know more about it i mean certainly for us all the um, kind of opportunities for devices to capture both imagery and telemetrics and so forth and so on um, are interesting and I think still seeking um, true application. Um, I think they're seeking ways to rise above just um, innovative niche experimentation, which, you know, that we're all going to go through. I mean, Google Glass mm -hmm. is a great example. I mean, it'll be a couple of years, three or four years, uh, you know, before it is more than 
I mean, I, I realize it'll become more retail available much sooner than that, but it, it, it'll still remain a, a while before the Warby Parker, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, mass versions of it become um, more commonplace for people to use. But I'd love to know more about what you're talking about. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, again, just, I mean, there are devices that have been that's about there historically, but um, I think autographers are sort of a great example of a device that you can wear around your neck or have it clipped somewhere, and it um, it has a sort of a variety of sensors which um, um, dictate when a when when a photograph is taken. Um, it's a heat sensor. There's a sort of GPS um, sort of inbuilt within it, and um, it helps you sort of record your day for people. And sort of connect to social media platforms and sort of so more easily to sort of um, post up uh, a lot, lot more photography um, directly from the device. And again, from us, from from a research perspective, it's uh, fascinating because it allows us to sort of record um, over a much longer period of time and sort of, sort of, and also help capture real, natural behaviour um, without us being in the room, snapping away and um, disrupting what people might be doing. Um, and yeah. I think. I you know Autographer have had their problems and they've just just launched. Um, but for us, it's a really interesting piece of technology. Yeah, no, it sounds great. I mean, uh, it certainly would uh, help us on the research side. We we do a lot of uh, research now, but it's uh, in terms of actual behavior. But as you might guess, a lot of it is self-reporting, um, mm. even at the moment through mobile apps and so forth and so on. So the Kind of, uh, you know, having that on in the background, um, I think, is a terrific idea. That's, that's an interesting po point you raised there, Matt. Because one of the things I wanted to uh, to ask you, John, or and ask everybody, was was about this sort of shift that I see from desktops to sort of more tablets and mobiles. Is that that's something you guys can see as well? Is that John? Uh, yeah, and no, I'm sorry, I didn't know the question was directed to me. Um, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll listen more closely for my name. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, the answer is yes. I mean, the bottom line is for us that mobile is becoming almost a default, uh, the default standard for us. And then instead of like the, the older behavior being desktop first and then degrade the experience to mobile, it's more about mobile first and then, and then enhance the experience for desktop. I mean, I, I guess you know, we're a global organization, so designing for mobile... Um, Designing for mobile makes sense in a lot of markets where smartphone, uh, thanks for a smartphone, uh, is growing enough, or um, uh, or mobile web ac uh, access is is, is um, strong enough, and that's not true in many markets around the world. But anyhow, long story short is that um, I think the interesting thing about designing for mobile first is it's really causing us to um, embrace this kind of new tiled content model, mm. which isn't just about um, visual imagery. Um, you know, we, news headlines, news stories are now being kind of packaged in that little kind of tile format, but but certainly, you know, it's the, it's an influence of the mobile experience, whether it be on a handheld um, smartphone or, or a, a tablet of some kind. And, uh, it may be a bit obvious, but you'd agree that with mobile and that kind of thing, a visual, uh, visual is more important. It's going to have more impact in terms of maybe telling telling stories or the value you're getting from it. Um, yeah, I would argue. Um, uh, again, you know, feel free to direct the question elsewhere. But um, I think the uh, the only thing I would say is that with mobile, I think we're much more about getting content nuggets attached to a task. So. Um, content nuggets, like visual content nuggets, are, are very, very helpful when you're out and about, if you will, um, in the middle of doing something. Um, I think, you know, when in terms of kind of spending time and exploring, certainly tablets are great, as, uh, you know, for that. Um, and then for getting more and creating or, or augmenting content, desktops are, are obviously the domain to be. Yeah, I, 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 can, I completely agree with that. I mean, for us, mobile um, is totally where it's at in terms of us being able to give respondents the ability to share real-time behaviour. Um, so, yeah, versus tablets, um, you know, the ability for online platforms like yourself, Visions Live, to, you know, offer apps that allow people to capture photography and video and post it up immediately is really, really um, interesting. 
Yes, it is, it is interesting. What, what do you think, Hassan, in terms of what could be achieved with visuals? In your, in your experience, where would you say the value can be derived from? Um, well, yeah, I think I, I think it's about kind of developing a visual identity for a brand, and like that that identity really then kind of forms the basis of how that like the story around that brand. Um, I mean, just in terms of kind of visual and social media, um, I think they kind of growth of Instagram has been has been really amazing. It's been really amazing to watch and that's really kind of um, illustrated the point that mobile is, is important and you know its content is being generated by mobile phones. It's being consumed on mobile phones and that's you know kind of even you know Facebook purchasing Instagram and Instagram becoming you know the um, from video to image, uh, it, it's how people are how consumers are, are um, kind of experiencing Could you could you make a distinction? Could you make a distinction between when it's best to use something visual, when that works best, and so you can achieve something more, and maybe when it's not? Uh, I think. Can, can you repeat the question? I didn't. Um, really what I was interested in was say if somebody was watching this, um, wh when do you think visuals might be best used, and when are they not? In my experience, I love to think about responding to people, for instance. You know, there's a famous example of body form responding to a Facebook post with a video about, about yeah. women. Yeah, that, I thought that was really, really funny. And there's the famous example of Twitter responding to the Super Bowl um, sort of blackout. So my, my question is, when is it best to use visuals? What, what, what can you achieve? What's, what's the best time to use them? And maybe what are times that aren't appropriate? That's what I was sort of trying to drive at, you know? I think maybe you know just you know just going along with what, what you said maybe as a way to um, answer a question or answer kind of questions that consumers um, may be having about a particular product and that can be a way to um, I mean that shows that the brand is really listening and really paying attention to what the consumer needs but also kind of being creative in how they respond because you know you can actually convey um, information in a really uh, shareable way if you can, you know, if you can change it from something that's text-based to something that's visual. Um, uh, so, so yeah, I mean, even you know, for example, we we work with a hotel and they've changed their prices on a couple of their products. Not the most exciting thing, but you know, we said like, look, if you can kind of develop this into a graphic that is attractive, that that kind of tell, you know, gives a little bit more context. That might be more shareable, more interesting than just kind of listing. Like, um, so I think yeah, as a way to kind of answer consumer questions or some kind of FAQs. I think just can I just jump in because I think the that you made a point earlier which I think was interesting. It's like you know res uh, real time responsive marketing is the buzz phrase of the moment, right? And it's meant to pour, uh, capture what cer certainly uh, many brands did, but Oreo got most credit for in that responsive um, uh, example with the Super Bowl. I, I think you know, and, and Ford's done it. You know, when when um, Jeremy Irons, uh, an actor, you know, made a, 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 a inadvertently disparaging comment around the Ford Fiesta, equating it with the uh, uh, Downtown Abbey. Well, he was actually criticizing Downtown Abbey as a you know kind of mainstream, not very a highbrow show. Anyhow, he equated it with the Ford Fiesta. Within 24 hours, Ford and and uh, and our team turned around a video, which was a, a direct response to um, Jeremy Irons. I think what's happening is, is that you know the the quick, uh, creative, thoughtful production on visual content, whether it be still imagery on Facebook or whether it be a video uh, published on YouTube or, or or Vine and then you know shared out through a Facebook community. I think surprises people, and, and the quality and the creativity is being, the, the game is really being upped um, uh, as more creative people, whether they be from some traditional visual background or whether they be like digital natives, are, are really figuring out how to create some great stuff. So, you know, yeah. I, I, think, I think that's interesting, John, because with traditional media, you know, like you had people that were sort of um, consuming content. Had to had to hang on. So I'm getting some feedback. Where's that? Uh, uh, bear me sorry. 
Yeah, so sorry, Matt. I'll, I'll mute you afterwards. What I was saying with traditional media, you you kind of everybody accepts that the message can't be tailored and it can't be maybe very specific because they're talking to a large audience. Whereas with social, it's about individuals, and you can create much more value with a tailored and specific um, response if you're willing to make that investment. And that, that's the distinction I would draw. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think so. I think that's fair. Matt, Matt, I'll come to you, Mark. But Matt, I did actually want to ask you the same question because you, you've got a different sort of skill set um, to say myself and um, and some of the others in the conversation. W what can you achieve with with visuals? Well, I'm actually starting oh, to think. Were you, did you say Mark or who did you say, Matt? <laughs> I says Matt, and then he started to talk, but I'm muted. I'm sorry, sorry it, Mark. It, no, no, I'll let Matt take it because uh, I think you cut off and I was like, well, okay, I better wake up here. Okay, Matt, take it. Great stuff. Um, I mean, there's a whole number of benefits that we can sort of derive from sort of using imagery, um, going through a couple of them. Um, sort of half our client base and our projects are international. Um, so, you know, we recruit respondents from uh, sort of lots of different markets and we'll be debriefing teams across multiple markets. And imagery is obviously just a universal uh a language, uh, particularly photography. Um, obviously, photography is subjective in terms of how you analyse it, but uh, it has that immediacy and it just cuts through the language barriers and the translation of, of those uh, are barriers. So that's one sort of really immediate benefit. Um, another sort of benefit that Hassan sort of touched upon was sort of the idea that it's engaging people in a more in a strategic environment in a more creative way. It's getting people to think about things uh, more creatively and more emotionally. Um, you know, there's a whole sort of area of debate around behavioral economics and whether people know what they think and know how they act and sort of how rationally driven that is. And photography is very useful for us to help um, uh, to, to, to help, help people um, communicate what they might be thinking. And sometimes that might be unconscious. Mm -hmm. um, so that's another sort of really, really interesting area. Um, and on the point that you made, so John, I can't remember who it was, in terms of just the quality of imagery. I mean, I used to be a photographer, and it's a bit depressing, if I'm honest. Um, you know, we're all really good photographers these days. The kit and the uh, is has, it just gets better and better, and the quality of and the creativity, the creativity that's out there is just astonishing. Um, so to sort of tap into that and to sort of harness it is fantastic from our perspective. Matt, can I uh, can I ask you a question in terms of uh, imagery has been mentioned a few times as being uh, universal in terms of uh, trying to create um, create brands and still tell stories about brands. But uh, the question I I have and uh, sometimes wonder uh, about. Uh, you know, more and more websites are, are using more and more video uh, techniques. There's less copy in them, etc., etc. Um, how important is uh, the imagery when it's been applied, or how crucial is it to get the right images when it's been applied across different, uh, uh, different cultures? Um, you know, one image might mean uh, one thing to one culture, another image might mean mean another thing to another uh, culture. And I, and I suppose if you don't get that. Right, um, you know things can kind of blow up in your 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 face. I would uh, uh, imagine at some point. Have you done any kind of research into that? Have you stumbled across that, or, or do you purposely uh, acknowledge that that goes on and, and think about these things when you you're putting studies together? Um, yeah, it's pretty more than the sort of the last point you made in terms of us just um, realizing it and uh, and acknowledging it and and being mindful of those differences, because you're absolutely right, they do exist. Um, if we're sending a photographer out to a different market, we, you know, we'll just have a good think about who we're sending out. We've got photojournalists in, uh, that we use in, in our main markets, Brazil, India, China, who understand sort of the cultural differences there and what those imagery, images that they're taking might mean. Um, but for us, you know, if you're mindful of it, you can use it to your advantage and put that into the debate. And you know, if if, we, if you're talking about the analysis of, of one photograph, for example, and whether a certain behaviour that you're capturing uh, might represent something, you can throw open the different subjective meanings of what that might mean to sort of help explore, you know, whatever it is your the project's about. You, you know, yes, I, I would, it's true. So Matt, you know, I, I loved what you were saying. I think that you know one of the things that we've learned 
not just with visual imagery, but it's certainly as true with visual imagery as everything. First of all, engage, um, uh, people engage with content more when it's local. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. so, yeah, everybody engages with photographs being shared on, on uh, Facebook, and we understand that's kind of the highest engaging content, all that. That's well and good. But the work that we do, like with Dryer's ice cream in, out of um, Singapore, you know, the more local, I mean, there was a, there's a... Um, a phenomena in Singapore as um, some of the um, kind of pollution, if you will, the fire uh, fires that were burning in neighboring countries were kind of creating a haze in Singapore, right? Um, and 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 our our ability to create visual content <laughs> that to some degree made you know poked a little fun at this, but but was very locally oriented to a phenomena that everyone recognized, um, you know, just made engagement numbers go through the roof and so it, there's a little bit about relevancy there's a little bit about um, uh, quite a bit of what you were describing and are, are uh, good to caution us on about the different cultural meanings of imagery and then there's just like down downright you know stuff about me and my community that matters more to me than you know broad-based stuff I don't know if that makes sense mm -hmm. I mean this, this, it does, slightly it doesn't it. sorry Mark go on no, 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 no. I was just saying that, you know, for us, for where we're at at the moment, is you know, we deal with quite controlled um, communities where we're recruiting people and we're sort of managing that process rather than dipping into a wider sort of global community and sort of analysing a mass of photography. Uh, so it's 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 that, I suppose that issue is slightly easier to control and, and manage. What what are your thoughts, Matt, about sort of using hypothetically? You know, if, I don't know if you're doing it at the moment, but I've heard of. I think I brought that example up with you before about you know people using sort of the images for, for market research. Whether it's I think it was Doritos, with um, uh, where they were looking at photos people had uh, put up onto Twitter of them eating Doritos at right when the Super Bowl was going on. So I don't, I don't mean to keep coming back to the Super Bowl, but they were taking these pictures and sort of analysing them. Do you, do you think? And I've also, I think maybe I linked you a video about how you could use Pinterest to do some research about how people perceive your brand or or a product. Have you got any thoughts about that? Or you cut out a little bit there. You, you, you're talking about imagery that's captured in a sort of um, in a research in a research project that you yeah, then so use in marketing perspective. Right, images that are uploaded by the users themselves. I think John mentioned that people are, or maybe that was a video I was watching of John late, earlier, but one of the two, John either said it in this hangout or he said it in a video before, but uh, mm. but the sort of users uploading a lot of this content and photos. So uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you said you have a controlled environment. What, mm. Do you think there's some sort of um, mileage in, in the photos and, and the social networks visually sort of harnessing the stuff that users are uploading? Massively. Massively, I mean, there's an obvious, an obvious sort of usage right challenge, and getting people on board who are sort of willing for their photography to be sort of used in, in a for a commercial purpose, and that's you know a grey area in itself um, in terms of getting those usage rights signed off. But I think it's a massive, massive opportunity. Um, as I said the creativity is there, and you know, we work with ad, ad agencies in London that are constantly um, putting creative briefs. Um, on sort of social platforms that they can get sort of people to sort of think of ideas themselves. So yeah, why not photography and video? Yeah, because I know Richard Stacey, John, who's um he's an English uh, social media guy, talks about sort of a social platform or network can be a brilliant place for a company to do some market research in terms oh, yeah. of you know instead of trying to push content out, um you know there there is some really effective things you can do. I, d I just wondered about that. You know, do you think if some a community manager or someone was listening to this, it would be valid for them to go to the director and say, look, you know, let let's try doing some of this. You know, you're spending a certain amount of budget on market research. Do you want to trial doing some research with the with the people who are actually following us that are engaged with us on social networks? Yeah, I mean that's already happening at scale, though. I mean, I think that's for a lot of our brands. I mean, I have a brand, a global FMCG brand who um, one of their core goals with their social business program is to reduce research costs by 20 percent overall you know augmenting a lot of the uh, techniques that they that are, you know, are still valid with the ability to reach into their you know five million or fifteen million you know fan base on Facebook to get reactions to things to enlist um, you know uh, uh, one percent of that audience into a, a closer kind of 
um, kind of focus group core, if you will. Um, I, we're already doing it right and left. I mean, you see brands doing it all the time, just pinging people with questions, um, uh, previewing new product, new flavors, new packaging, uh, all of those kinds of things. So I think that, I, I think the ambition there is well documented. I think there's a lot of great cases underway. I think that 20% goal, operationalizing it to the point where it's highly effective, is really the routine that we're in right now. Um, so you make a great point. John, from your perspective, how happy? Because we haven't done so much of that ourselves. How how happy are people who might be on might be following a certain brand's sort of Facebook page to, to then be asked sort of research questions or generally be involved in in research? Uh, well, I mean, the devil's in the details. However, I think the the general notion that that a brand cares enough uh, to ask their point of view, um, um, you know, positions it well. Um, demonstrates that they're kind of listening and responding to people that buy their products. I mean, it's generally well received. It's been been my experience. So, I think it's it's. Um, I, I think the biggest challenge, and you might have something to say about this, is that you know um, Facebook's um, you know billions of of users, notwithstanding, in a in a very uh, kind of media uh, social media mature market, if you will, we run into the you know. The, the challenge all the time of being clear is the is the social media responding audience representative of the mass population in a particular market. Um, exactly. Uh, so I, I think I, I, I see two things. One is I think there's a general belief that if if that they generally are a kind of leading edge in a market, which it may not be true. I'm just telling you what I see that they are a leading edge and therefore must be listened to. And the second thing I hear is that, look, we know it's not perfect, but it's pretty good, and it helps us. You know, we can use it research for pointers uh, to things we should do. It's not necessarily going to mean that we're going to, you know, change our product mix up that, you know, dramatically. I don't know if you agree with that. Mm, I think that's I, – I do, yeah. I mean, exactly. We get, when we get given a brief, we get given a very specific recruitment spec. So you know we're asked to go and find people who fit a very very specific, well, not very specific, but um, sort of a range of different um, specific criteria. Um, but I, I completely agree to have that as a supplementary tool that you can dip into um, and sort of see if what it is is um, great. Did, well, did you have any? Do you have any thoughts, Mark, about some of the things that are coming up? Mark. Yeah. Yep. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, that's okay. I, I had myself muted. Oh, well, first of all, I don't uh, use a lot of imagery, so I'm listening to a lot of this. Uh, um, very interesting to see how you know the, the depth of the approach for marketing and research and stuff like that. And I was one of the things that I was just wondering right off of what Matt just said is, um, do you project? Do you, for example, use a, a, a range of images if you're trying to recruit people, as you said, for a specific uh, market or something like that? Project them to different social media outlets, and then see who you get. You know, like who do you get from Instagram and who do you get from Pinterest? So, so you've you've created an image to attract, supposedly, or at least that's what you're trying to determine, a specific person. Do you then broadcast to multiple channels? And then see who who you can bring in on that. Is that a technique you've? I'm sure somebody must be doing that, right? We're not. That's a wicked idea. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Sorry. Well, do you do you mean That's kind of creating? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Do you mean like kind of creating the same content and you know, uh, testing out on different social networks to see like what what you get the best response on? Well, that's what I was thinking. Is that is that if you were if you were as as Matt was talking about, he he's sometimes he's trying he's told to find an audience, find a specific audience to meet a specification. So what I was thinking is that you would you would have your designer either select the right imagery that you think will attract that audience, or you know design an infographic or an image uh, that will attract that specific person. So there's got to be a little science behind it too. Um, but then broadcast it to multiple channels, and you're 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 kind of fishing, but you're using specific bait. So you're seeing who you pull in because it's very difficult, I think, to uh, to look at any specific social media channel like Facebook or or Twitter and say 
this is the kind of person who hangs out there because every time I see somebody say that, every time I see somebody generalize like that, they're wrong because there's a variety of people that use each of these networks for their own purposes. So if you have a targeted image, can you then find the right people on those networks and pull them into whatever your advertising or marketing goal is? I think it kind of depends on how yeah, you optimize, um, like kind of optimize like an image for, for a, a network. I mean, we, we really believe in, um, you know, creating content that will work on specific platforms and then really optimizing it for that for, for that platform so that you kind of get the definitely the right audience. Um, and, you know, there's a variety of ways that you can do that either by you know, yeah, but or basically join the white communities. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, I, I do think people will test you know, images on different channels, and I, I think there's always going to be an element of trial and error. That's a really natural part of you know, building communities and doing social media is you know trying to see like what how certain content will. Um, but but here's the thing I would add though. I mean, I would just add that if I, you know, Mark, if I understood part of your question was that, you know, a lot of the plat the platforms are very different. So for Facebook and LinkedIn, there's a high degree of targeting we can do. Um, you know, not just with the um, paid platform and our ability to segment, you know, messaging down through the paid channel, which is essentially content through the paid channel. But there, but increasingly, even in the in the content publishing in Facebook, we have the ability to kind of um, to segment and target content to particular geographies and to particular, you know, all the demographics that we can that we have controls over. Tumblr, as an example, uh, uh, doesn't have that <laughs> uh, yet. Uh, well, doesn't have that. Period. I don't actually know if "yet" is the right word to add because I know they have a sensibility about um, kind of going that deep into the kind of segmenting their audience and giving those controls to brands. We'll see. But, you know, in Tumblr, uh, you know, the name of the game is a lot more about, you know, drawing people in through relevancy, really understanding or, or to the best of your abilities what content, whether it be visual or any other content, really, really resonates with, you know, 20-some-odd males versus 45-year-old moms and so forth and so on. So I think there's a lot – there will be continuing pressure on us – um, on us as marketers to understand what what is really relevant to different um, people who, who um, have different needs and, and we, we, we will the pressure will be on us to create the, the stuff that they value most it can't just be stuff that tells our brand story the best uh, and I think the pressures on us to get a lot more data driven uh, which we are I mean a lot you know it's it's Almost crazy how much we're all scrambling to kind of not uh, to you know to make sense out of how to use data to create content as well as to deliver it. And the best example there, and then I'll, I'll shut up, is that you know a, a pretty routine practice for us is to understand what particular people, moms, let's say, are searching for in Google, um, and what they're sharing in social media, what they're saying publicly uh, in social media around needs around I don't know baby food, for instance. Um, and that gives us the cues to actually create content, much of which is visual, videos, um, imagery, but you know other content as well, that directly meets their stated needs is what their intention has been uh, kind of expressed through Google search and through um, what they're saying online. And it's not about gaming the system in any way. It's completely the opposite. It's about kind of religiously li listening to what people want and then uh, doing our best to create the content that's going to be most helpful to them. So, anyhow, that's my data driven. That's, that's actually um, something that sort of strikes a big chord with me because um, when I read a lot of the, the guys I think are influential, the social things should be about listening and responding. And, you know, if you're going to put content into a space, whether that's your platform, like on Facebook, or whether it's a, a hashtag, it should be information that answers questions that are being asked in that space in a very sort of real time sense. Um, and I've I've heard people like um, Stacy again say that uh, talks Daniel Alf and he he says the same thing. You know, um, what does everybody else think about that? About sort of the response element and using visuals to respond to people. I mean, again, for us, absolutely fascinating. So you know, we recently did a uh, project with a sort of 
global um, sportswear company, and we had an international community that were that were interrogating the idea of performance, and um, you know we created an online community where they were doing just that. They were sort of communicating through uh, through imagery and sort of their understanding of what performance meant to them in their field of sport, and um, it worked really really well. Again, mainly because of that language barrier. Um, so yeah, it's um, uh, vital for us. Can I ask you a question for um, for John? I just kind of wondered, like you know, with with a social overview, do you guys like uh, you know when you're developing visual content, how closely do are your kind of social marketers working with your designers? Like how does that work? How does kind of collaboration work there? How do you decide what's going to happen? So, uh, Hassan, you, you have an awful lot of noise there. So, how how closely do who work with our designers? That uh, um, your your people who are doing community management and social yeah, media, yeah. um, or how are they collaborating with your yeah. designers and co-founders? <laughs> yeah, it's a great question actually, because it's a whole new dynamic, right? We have um, we have community directors. It's a small um, kind of refinement on the job title, if you will, but it basically signifies that they have a lot more authority. Um, uh, and responsibility in managing uh, the business outcome of a Facebook community or, or whatever, t Twitter followership or whatnot. Um, and uh, so long story short is that the community directors, the guys and gals who are actually um, managing those, those uh, communities, are kind of like um, orchestra conductors of content. So they work very closely with the designers. They are the people that give that translate feedback about what's working and what's resonating best uh, in the marketplace. We see that with our Nescafe um, Facebook page, a global page, which is managed out of um, our team in, um, in Frankfurt, actually. So the community director will sit down with designers based on a, you know, working with a content calendar, of course, and it's collaborative. You know, does, there's a, you know, a place like Ogilvy, I mean, um, there's a lot of creative <laughs> heritage and, uh, let's just say, authority amongst the um, designers, uh, the writers, and so forth and so on that make up the, the kind of creative core here. So it's been a journey for us to build a new collaborative behavior uh, between those community directors and those creatives. So long, long answer, but essentially a, a very hot topic for us. Can I, can I just ask you another question related to, to that there? Uh, John, in terms of uh, your client interaction, do 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 they do they understand the the whole area that you're trying to do when you're you're telling stories visually and visual visually me uh, visual media? Um, do they do you actually get the whole thing, or are they quite switched on to this? Are they driving some of some of this within the briefs to you as a as a uh, as a marketing business, or, or are you having to have more on the look? We can advise you and we recommend uh, side of the the equation on that. Uh, well, I mean, if I you know if I get your question, uh, Ben, I mean, essentially we've got um, uh, you know brands that are all along the social maturity curve if there is such a thing it's kind of snotty and judgmental to even call it that but whatever people who are believers people who are just starting and a lot of people in between so uh, we have a lot of clients who totally get it I think who are thinking about this more in terms of content marketing now um, I think social has kind of um, um, not become the only way to describe kind of what's going on here I think they think in terms of content marketing and they're very keen to understand what drives performance, you know, um, follow metrics, which are all about user engagement and, God willing, some sort of action step that we're asking people to do. So, uh, you know, I think they are pretty sophisticated. I mean, Ford is a good example. They, they totally get this. You know, we're building a full global content studio for them right now, which is essentially a kind of operationalized way to um, use content marketing across not just social channels but earn channels and paid channels and you know all of their marcom and, and that reflects a certain amount of sophistication after having kind of been in the trenches for the past few years doing stuff in social sure I've got a question from uh, Kaz um, who's uh, just left it on sort of the, the event um, I'm just going to read what he's asked he says um, John 
because images on Facebook tend to be more engaging, do you guys think, from a network's point of view, that there's competition and conflict between visual media on social and monetizing social ad space? Um... No, <laughs> sorry. I had to kind of think about what I had to kind of guess what the person is, what, what they're uh, fishing for. I mean, is there competition because of the um, you know obvious kind of higher level of engagement with imagery? Is there competition between um, I guess the uh, earned or shared space uh, with um, paid media? No, I mean you know we use, we're big believers in integrated social media marketing, which means you know planning and practicing using paid, owned, and earned channels together, and so paid as an amplifier, putting content down through the paid channel, whether it be a Facebook, you know, sponsored story or, I don't know, some sort of display advertising where we're actually now putting uh, content down, not, you know, kind of traditional advertising of sorts, uh, only makes us, only um, helps us uh, expand the reach, the relevant reach um, of programs we're doing. So uh, I don't see any conflict whatsoever. And um, we had one other question um, from Matt Greenberger. Uh, he wanted to ask, um, well, he said, we do research with our engaged users, but the pushback is that old saw. The online audience is not representative. Is the perception that web dwellers are outliers changing, or do you still get that? So, John or Matt, would you have an opinion about that? I'll, I'll let Matt go first here on this one. Except Matt doesn't hear us. I'll pass you back to John. <laughs> uh, 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 fair enough. Can you so, repeat? Yeah, give us the give us the question uh, more, one more time. I think we've got both of us back here. So Ben, yeah. Sorry, I muted myself. And ben, started talking. I think you're muted. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. Give us okay. the question one more time. So what he said is that yep. he does research with his engaged users um, on social, but the pushback is that old saw that the online audience is not representative. Yeah, and yeah. he's asking, is the perception that web uh, dwellers are out outliers changing, or yeah. do you still get that? I think he's I think he's asking yeah about whether or not the the online audience is representative. Yeah, I think that's what I brought up before, and I'll, I'll, I'll let Matt uh, speak about this as well. I, I do think that it really depends upon the marketplace. Um, you know, the U.S. or the U.K. or Australia is one thing. Um, you know, I think um, South Africa is another thing. India is another thing. So it's very hard to generalize, especially when you're talking around the world. But in a in a kind of a a big uh, media social media mature marketplace where there's a lot of connectivity, a lot of participation in social networks. Um, you know, I think we have to be careful that the lessons that we're learning from the people who are responding online uh, may not be reflective of our complete customer base. Now, it doesn't mean that they're meaningless, and so that's what I was trying to say before. I think they're, the feedback we get from those folks can be hugely helpful. I mean, um, there's a huge difference, I know, for those folks in, uh, who are deep thinkers in research between quantitative and qualitative, and we have to be uh, clear about what lessons we're taking away, but but I think it's still hugely helpful, even though, yes, it's true, they may not be representative of a complete customer base. I don't know, Matt, do you feel differently about that? No, I completely agree. I think one, the, the types of projects where it does become um, more useful are when we're asked to uh, interrogate um, loyalist groups, people who are sort of uh, particular advocates of a certain brand or, or, or product. So we've re recently done a project for a certain uh, car brand, uh, and the type of car brand it is that there are a very sort of sort of core set of loyalists. So um, for that project, yes, it was it was highly relevant that we that that, that we could. Um, Sort of uh, uh, use their sort of social media space to um, ask other questions, but it is a challenge for us. And uh, as I said earlier, um, more often than not, uh, the recruitment spec is just too specific for us to uh, sort of propose sort of carrying out that research in, in, in that open way. So again, we're learning. Uh, we, we, you know, we, we are not experts in social media, so we're, sort of, we're learning how to sort of navigate through that, that that problem, and that is one of the sort of the big problems for us. 
you know, versus using sort of um, online platforms like yourselves, and also the the idea that we that we would, you know, over time, um, you know, build our own community. Oh, we've got a question from Pierre. Um, if anybody wants to to give him an answer, he's asking, um, can we give him a concrete example of a visual that sells for a small business company, an author, a restaurant? So, sort of maybe what visuals would work for those? Ah. That sounds for a small business campaign inside a restaurant. Well, uh, <laughs> that's an amazing I, question. <laughs> it, it is. I, I just think that you know it's interesting to me because I think social media is 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 so wonderfully tailored to the needs of small business. I mean, and we see it now. I mean, American Express has a lot of focus in the small business market, and I'm not. Uh, but but a lot of it is about enabling small business. Uh, to use uh, social well, whether it be visual content or not, to uh, you know whatever meet whatever their needs are, um, and I see a lot of it in the kind of dealer-based work we do, the Ford um, dealer uh, base, uh, which are you know small and medium-sized businesses. You know some are large dealerships, car dealerships, Caterpillar um, again dealerships, which run you know mid-sized small business. I mean they're they're becoming I just we just recently um, are doing some, we're doing some training of, for caterpillar on the dealer level which caused us to audit what all the dealers were already doing and I'm gonna tell you that amongst the caterpillar dealers B2, you know this is weird right b2b big machines that move earth I mean you wouldn't think this but there are some really stellar examples of these small business and medium-sized businesses using Facebook using uh, tumblr even using Twitter using LinkedIn, of course, and a lot of it's visual content. I mean, they're totally getting it. It's publishing uh, how-tos, testimonials from customers, video testimonials from customers, which are gold, all the way down to, you know, Caterpillar's big machines. Everyone likes a picture of a big machine, you know, breaking ground on a new school or something like that. So I, I think there's plenty of practices out there right now. I don't know if that's what they're getting at. I think I think that's actually brilliant. It's really made me start thinking there because I think that if you if you've got a small business and you want to know what visuals are going to sell your products, you want to look at in spaces where the questions that your products or your services solve, what questions are being asked, and then you can use visuals of of your product or your services to do that. Do you, so I'm talking about in an instance where maybe um, you're talking about sort of caterpillar that kind of thing. Um, you know, if it, well, <laughs> that's probably a bad example for me because I don't know what 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 problems they solve. But you know, if you're talking about sort of like a, a restaurant, for instance, and people are looking for somewhere to go to eat, putting visual pictures of your products in response to those questions, if you're listening properly on social, would be an appropriate way of doing that. That's probably a better example. Yep. Anyone else? Mark, you had a question. Yeah, I'll, uh, well, I'm going to toss in a couple of things here. Uh, first of all, I, I think that uh, one of the things in, uh, that I see a lot of people messing up with is that they like to, you know, everybody's really advocating using imagery in one form or another, either for content marketing or, uh, you know, for uh, engaging with your customers. But they're making these mistakes where they're not really looking at the images that they're putting out. They're putting in it, they're, they're using it images for the sake of having something because they were told that will bring in more visitors to their blog or that will get them more customers. Mm. So uh, one of the things, and, and I don't respond, to, I mean I'm a very visually oriented person so I respond but also I'm going to respond negatively if I see that there's been no thought put towards an image that's been selected. For example, people who like to just grab stock photography and shovel it into their blog. Uh, I immediately look at that and say, if you put no thought into the image you selected, then the content that you're trying to deliver to me has no value either. So you can, you can, it's a double-edged sword, I think, because if you rely on visual elements too much and you do not put any thought to uh, any kind of science to how you're selecting them, you're going to drive away a certain demographic of people. You're going to be rated by that picture. So you should think about that. Uh, I would think that's my advice for, from the bottom here. Is is you know you're going to turn off some people in addition to turning them on. So how do you how do you anticipate that? I guess is part of it. Go ahead, John. I'm sorry. 
Yeah, no, no, you just spark a really good issue, I think, Mark, which is that it's not restricted to visual imagery, but it's any kind of content, which is if, if you're a brand uh, and trying to really get the most out of social um, networks, um, there's a danger you have of chasing engagement numbers, right? Because engagement numbers are great. They're indicative of preference, perhaps purchase consideration. Um, but, you know, I see this all the time where community managers of, of, of brands will discover that their most engaging message was Happy Chinese New Year, which, you know, you know, it's just something that's a cultural thing. It happens uh, presumably once a year. <laughs> um, and, and, and But how relevant is that to your, to your brand and your message? How relevant is it to the customers that you want to engage? I, I think that while it may, um, you may see some number spike, which I guess is a, in some ways mark a counter to what you're saying, but I think it's supporting your point that you really need to figure out what's relevant for the people you're trying to engage and what you're selling or what your business is. It's not, you can't just blindly chase after uh, numbers or you can't blindly chase after a trend of like visual imagery and, and put up anything you want uh, under the sun. Right. Well, I mean, so what if you're getting likes and, and shares? Are the people liking and sharing something that is going to turn them into customers? I mean, so what if you're sharing the quote of the day in a nice little picture of a kitten or something like that? Yeah. Uh, are you in the kitten business? Are you in the quote of the day business? And if you're not, uh, it's nice that you're, I mean, it's nice you're exp increasing brand exposure. I can see that value, but you're not, uh, I, I see that as a mistake. I mean, I, uh, you know, a lot of people dive into the to the visual uh, end of the pool head first, and I'm not seeing a lot of thought behind it. So I, you know, I'm kind of being a little skeptical of of some of this. Um, you know. If I, I if I could add, um, so, sorry, I just want to add uh, just a little point to that. Um, Matt said, uh, I think said earlier about the quality of photography equipment that is available nowadays and what you can do with with uh, photos, you know, but uh, in the post edit uh, with Photoshop, etc., etc. And just because you know how to use a camera and you know you know how to use all these tools, um, doesn't actually mean you really know how to use them for marketing uh, or research purposes, etc. So um, I think that's a valid point to make as well. You still got to have that keen eye and that knowledge for what uh, what your customers are actually looking for and what you're actually trying to communicate in the first place. Uh, and your your kit, your uh, cute kitten point is is well made in its own right. Uh, it's nothing worse than that. Uh, I like seeing the, the last thing I like to see first thing in the morning is a, a cute kitten staring at me out a brandy glass saying um, <laughs> you know, have a nice day or something like that. It's uh, it's just not relevant to what I'm going through at that point in time. Um, and, and I suspect that a lot of people uh, have exactly the same view. Uh, getting back to your, your point you made about Happy Chinese New Year, it's um, you know it's probably not relevant. It's probably relevant to a whole load of people, well, um, I mean, uh, given the size of China. But um, <laughs> no, well, not, not actually, the rest of the world. In that case, I'm not saying it's not relevant to people. What I'm saying is it's probably not relevant to the brand. I mean, anyone yes. can do that, and, 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 and I think staying focused on what you're trying to accomplish as a brand makes sense. The one thing I want to throw in, I know we're getting close to the end of our time, is that I think one of the pitfalls of the um, excitement around visual imagery um, for brands has become, you know, this kind of, um, you know, uh, Facebook now talks about, you know, the new print, right? So we see a lot of brands publishing imagery, which essentially, uh, you know, are really cool, hopefully more often than not well thought out clever print ads, you know, yeah. uh, you know, showing their product in a clever, you know, highly relevant way or whatever. And there's nothing wrong with that. And But I think that that as the end game or uh, uh, kind of the expression of the ultimate best practice um, in visual in engagement is probably a little short-sighted. And mostly because I think what that largely does is it generates lots of object clicks, uh, uh, likes rather, which as we know uh, doesn't force the content down through my newsfeed. And, you know, you have to comment, you have to share, it has to be that much, you know, it has to require, uh, kind of inspire that much more um, engagement from the audience for me to pass it through my social graph of, you know, X number of friends. So I think we have to be careful that we don't just stop at creating imagery that a lot of people like. It has to, we have to go beyond that. Yes, um, yeah, I, know, I, know you're, I know you're going to be a busy guy, John, and we're getting sort of on the dot now. 
Can I ask one more question from Molly Darden? She uh, just wants to know, younger people seem to be turning away from Facebook. <laughs> what do you see of trending markets using Facebook? <laughs> Yeah, you know that's true. You know, we see. Uh, you know, I I hear that a lot. I mean, I, I don't. Um, you know, people even speculate is there going to be a is face is Facebook going to face a MySpace ization, if you will. Well, the MySpace is making a comeback even. Um, you know, yeah, I think it's true. I think that um, I see a lot of people in their uh, late teens and twenties, um, you know, kind of opting out or or not or not. Um, staying as active in Facebook, um, going to like platforms like WeChat and other platforms for instant communication and whatever, a whole bunch of other platforms. I, I think there's a real trend there. I, I don't think, for instance, I don't think it's going to undermine the role of Facebook as kind of the plumbing of our lives. I think the sheer vast numbers of that uh, platform, you know, across the world will mean that we'll you know, kind of build it into our lives and come back to it again and again, even if we go off to uh, engage in other platforms. That's 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 my point of view. Anybody else got anything to add as we, as we about to hang out up? Um, so okay. then, yeah, I just wanted to say, kind of going back to that point about, um, I think you know, for for reaching other audiences, you know, it, it's about looking to. Um, uh, platforms that young people are really using um, and uh, really getting people who are doing social again kind of going back to John's point about how um, people who are doing leading communities and designers getting those people together because it's about kind of uh, a strong brand experience uh, a strong visual identity that is kind of you know, really kind of differentiate um, certain brands from others who kind of really invest in, in that that side of um, you know, visual content development. So I think that's something that uh, will will and should happen more. It's quite hard to hear what you were saying there, Ram Hassan, because of the noise in the background. Was uh, sorry about that. That's okay. No worries. Was there a question, or, or, or I I didn't get some of that. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I was just saying that um, I think. In the future, like people who are leading communities, will be working with uh, designers and content creators more, and that's what will differentiate um, content, visual content for brands um, that will that will stick mm -hmm. out. Um, if you have people with no kind of design sense, you know, trying to develop video uh, visual content, that's you know, it might not work as well. So uh, I just think that that's probably something that's going to happen more. Mm -hmm. It should happen more. And John, any any sort of thoughts on that, or any last thoughts? Yeah, no, I think that's right. I mean, I think we we see that um, um, the qual the the appetite for higher quality content, better pictures, better video, um, better stories. Um, so it's not just the technical quality of this stuff, but the creative communication. You know, I think we, we there's still a lot of uh, appetite for that spontaneous, clumsy content that's out there. That we all create, that I create, even. Uh, yet, I think there's an increasing um, appetite and um, uh, demand from people for for higher quality stuff because there's just so much clutter out there. I mean, there's so much content. Period. <laughs> I mean, if you're not, if you're not, you know, we all have to be selective about what we're going to pay attention to. And I think a lot of us, consciously or unconsciously, uh, to Hassan's point, really appreciate quality. And uh, so I think the quality levels are going to continue to rise. Okay, well, I'd, li I'd like to thank everyone that's been on the Hangout, and I'd, I'd really like to sort of say thank you to you, John, for giving us some of your time and, and sharing your, your experience. Thank you. That was great. Thank you, John. Thanks, everybody. Okay, thanks, guys. Thanks, Matt. Thank thanks, thank Mark. Hassan. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you Have very a good much. Rest of the day. See you later. Yeah.